Praise the Lord. Have you found that verse to be true where he says his grace is sufficient? So how do you know God's real? Because he walks with me, that's how. You've been in those hard places and you know that he's in the room with you. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Let's open our Bibles tonight to Genesis chapter number 21. Genesis chapter number 21. Been preaching some with different Bible pairs in the scripture and we will be dealing with Abraham here. We started last time talking some about Abraham and Lot. The idea and the subject of letting go. And really with Abraham's life we see that kind of starting with his family in Ur of the Chaldees and his nephew Lot. And then here he has Isaac, I mean, excuse me, Ishmael. And then he has to deal with Isaac. So all of this really leads up to what, Lord willing, we may deal with next week, and that is sacrificing Isaac. But Genesis chapter number 21, look down, if you will, in verse number 9. If you remember your story in your Bible correctly, you'll remember how that Abraham and Sarah... They didn't have any children, and God had promised Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Well, Sarah got a little ahead of God, and she said, we need to get a surrogate mother here. So they went sideways, and they went kind of behind God's back and had this woman, Hagar, from Egypt, and Abraham had a child by her, and Ishmael was his name. And, of course, then 13 years later, God visited Sarah, and she had Isaac. Notice in Genesis chapter number 21, Well, verses 1 through 8, we have the birth of Isaac. And you'll notice that uh, he he grows in verse number 8, and he's weaned. Verse number 9, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore, she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. That's tough, men. When your wife tells you something, the Lord says, yeah, she's right. That's it, isn't it? Verse 12, hearken unto her voice. Last time a man did that, we got into trouble. But this time, he's, she's following God. Hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and took bread and a bottle of water, and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs, and she went and set her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot, for she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him, and lift up her voice, and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this portion of Scripture, and we thank you for these great examples in the Bible. And we have Abraham, the father of faith, for us to even look to as an example. God, I pray we might get the understanding that we need in some of these hard spots that deal with relationships. God, give us wisdom, give us courage, help us to be obedient to the Word of God, and also to put Jesus Christ first. We ask it in His precious name. Amen. Turn in your Bible, if you will, to the New Testament, to Galatians chapter number 4. And so while you're turning, we understand that Ishmael came from this relationship that was really a fleshly, carnal means to try to produce something spiritual. And you can never produce anything spiritual by carnal means. It's like the church doesn't learn that. We always try to use the world's methods to bring about God's results. 
And God's not going to bless things that way. And so God had told Abraham and Sarah, I'm going to give you a child, but they went around the back door and tried to do God's message and try to fulfill God's message man's way. And notice here in Galatians chapter number 4, the allegory that's brought about and the example, and this is where I'm going tonight, to deal with some things spiritually and also dealing with our relationships in a practical way. But look in Galatians chapter number 4. Come down, if you will, to verse number 22. Galatians 4 and verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Verse 29, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. The comparison we have is between the two natures. The bondwoman produces a man after the flesh. The free woman produces someone after the spirit. In Jesus Christ, you have liberty and you're free. The flesh genders to bondage. It produces bondage that people are under some type of legal system. The Holy Spirit sets us free in Christ. We're free in Jesus Christ. We're not bound by some legalities. We serve Jesus because we love Him and because we want to. But there's a contrast to that, and the contrast is the flesh. The flesh serves out of duty and out of obligation, not out of love, and you have to watch that even in your own Christian service. So we have this struggle here. We have one son who's the firstborn. He's been with you a whole lot longer than Isaac. And the firstborn is a type of the flesh that has a grip on you by way of nature and by way of longevity. And then you have the spirit, you have the one born after the spirit, which is Isaac. So that's a type of the two natures of the believer. You have the old man, Paul calls it. The old man is the flesh. It's the part of you that you were born with. But then as you trusted Christ, you have the new man, which is born not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Look in chapter 5 of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, look over in verse number 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. So he gives the works of the flesh, verses 19, 20, and 21. And then he gives, verse 21, not the works of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit. See the difference? Fruit is something that's produced because of the root system and because of the actual plant. It's something God gives. The works of the flesh is something that's generated through the flesh. If you're going to do anything for God, it's going to be the fruit of the Spirit. And when you do that, it'll be the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of you. So there at the end when we say, you know, anything I do that is good and that is for Christ... It comes from Him, it's to Him, it's of Him, it's for Him. So give all the glory to God. Anything that's bad that you do, take the credit for. Anything that's good that you do, give Him the credit for. That's the idea. The fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of you. You have the choice, though, to be the vehicle to either yield to the flesh because you have the tendency to be an Isaac or to be an Ishmael. And oftentimes we yield to that Ishmael tendency, that man of the field, that man of that has a propensity and half of him is Egyptian, that man that winds up taking a wife out of Egypt, we have that tendency. 
And so doctrinally we have to understand this as a whole lot deeper than just some story with Isaac and Ishmael. Obviously we know the prophetic impl implications. When you study the Middle East you have obviously uh, God's people, the, uh, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not just the descendants of Abraham. And then you have the Muslims and the nation of Islam and all that that claim descendancy from Ishmael. But doctrinally for us, are you going to yield to the flesh or are you going to yield to the spirit? That's your choice. And you can make that choice, Romans chapter number 6, who you yield yourselves to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. And you make that choice to yield. Now, they never should have had Ishmael to start with. There comes a point here, and this is what I want to really preach, and we'll talk about it practically. There comes a point in Abraham's life, just like he had to let go of Lot. Remember last week? That was his nephew. His, his father was dead. Abraham took him for his own son, but God had told him, you need to come out of Ur of the Chaldees. You need to come out from your father's household. Leave your family behind. But he had a hard time letting go of Lot. But there came to a point when they had some contention, he finally had to say, Lot, you choose where you want to go, and I'll choose where I want to go. And he let Lot make that choice, and then he even went down. He tried to rescue Lot. He tried to get Lot out of Sodom. What happened? Lot went right back to Sodom. Do what you can. Pray for him. Try to rescue them if you can. But in the end, he prayed and God delivered Lot out of Sodom. But Lot had gotten some bad trouble. And so it's a great lesson in Abraham's life. He learns he's got to let go of things and he let go of Lot. But now this is a little closer to home. Ishmael was not Sarah's son, but Ishmael was Abraham's son. Blood's thicker than water. Lot might have been his nephew, but this is his boy. He's 13 years old. He's taught him everything he knows about how to live outside and how to, how to hunt and how to do things. 13 years. And Sarah finally says, I had enough. <laughs> you got to get this woman out of here. And if she goes, he goes. Because now he's starting to pick on Isaac. And Abraham's like, I don't think so. I, he, I'm, he's going to help me, you know, do the crops. And he's going to take over the family business. And i got all these plans. God says, you better listen to your wife. What man wants to listen to his wife? By nature, us men, we don't think wives even have any sense, right? That's how we are. We just think we got it all figured out. We know the Bible better. We know life better. We know everything better. We even try to tell them how to cook sometimes. Lord says, you better listen to her. Sometimes Christians will say, listen to your Sarah. Now see, the Bible tells you Sarah's in here in 1 Peter chapter number 3 how to go about this. Now here it looks like she's pretty, she lays down the line of the law pretty good right here. But the Bible says she called him Lord, little L. <laughs> she called him Lord, so there's a certain way that she approached un, unto him. And you ladies, you got to realize the male ego, it, it, it doesn't like to be run over. You have to treat men sometimes like Barney Fife. In other words, you have to... <laughs> In other words, you have to put an idea in his head. And you've got to encourage him in that, and you've got to pray for him, and you've got to treat him like a Lord, a little L. And then whenever he eventually comes to that solution, he'll think it's his idea. And then he'll be the big dog still. So Sarah had a way that she went about things. But sometimes us men, sometimes our wives will say something, and they'll be more spiritual on it. Like I said this morning, this is our authority. And if she's telling you something that's in the scripture, you need to listen to that. I'm not saying you hold a council and everybody gets a vote in this family, all that kind of craziness. Everybody can't have a vote. Sometimes decisions have to be made. And I think we understand that. We've got enough men in here that realize if you have to tell everybody you're running your house, you're not running your house. So if you're telling everybody you're wearing the britches, you're going around in a Hawaiian skirt or something like that. <laughs> or uh, whatever the Scottish, what do they wear? The kilt, you're wearing your kilt. Uh, is that what it's called, a kilt? All right. So it's time to kick him out. They never should have got involved in this situation to begin with. Here's, here's the message. I'll give you these things here. Number one, there's a decision. You have to make the break. There's a decision to be made. 
The problem is there's a, con there's a connection. This is his firstborn son. There's a connection there that's real strong. And I'm telling you, it is hard, especially dealing with relationships, to make some of these breaks. The best thing to do is to approach it this way. Get closer and closer to Jesus, as close to Jesus Christ as you can, and it will make any break with ungodliness easier. Because if you love Jesus, you'll realize whether it's family or not, there's certain things I can't go, certain things I can't do, certain places I can't go, certain people, even family, I cannot be around because if Jesus isn't welcome there, I'm not welcome there. Amen. So it's not necessarily a family thing. It's, you know, I love Jesus. And so Jesus Christ comes first. And so there's a connection, and no doubt the, the connection of 13, 14, 15 years that's a long time. He grew up in their house. And no doubt there's this kind of idea, let's just make Ishmael holy, let's just convert him, let's just clean him up a little bit, but you can't make holy that which is profane. God said, kick him out. This guy is wicked. Now, it's hard for us sometimes to see some of these things. You ever study the nation of Israel back in the Old Testament? You're going through, you're like, man, this is hard. The Bible, the old Bibles used to have red around it because the Bible's a bloody book, not just because of the precious blood of Christ, but there's a lot of bloodshed in the Bible. There's a lot of wars in the Bible. He told the nation of Israel to go in and wipe out the Canaanites. That's a hard saying. But he makes a statement later on. He says, the reason I'm telling you to do that, it's not for your greatness that I'm bringing you into the land. It's because of their abominations and their wickedness, which he lists in Leviticus oh, uh, 17, 18, 19, all the garbage they were doing in the land. He says, for those abominations, I'm judging those nations. And he tells Abraham he's going to judge the Amorites through him as well. So there's something else going on because of all that. And God says you can't clean certain things up. You ever do that around the house? You're working on something. Maybe you, you have some old grease rags out in the garage or something. And, and you're hanging on to them. You, maybe you, you do grease fittings and stuff. You guys know what I'm talking about. And you're put, putting your grease in there. And you got your rags. And you keep those things. And finally after a while, man, they're just you grab it. It's just full of grease. You just have to finally come to the place, you throw it out. You're not cleaning it up. It's a break. It's a decision that has to be made. You just got to make a break. It's a divorce, if you want to use that term. It can't be repaired. It can't be mended. A decision's got to be made. There's a connection, but there's also a concubine because he's got to lose Hagar too. You see, this thing has effects to it, and sometimes people deal with things in society regarding friendships, regarding family members, even regarding connections they have in business or in jobs because of what that's going to do with the domino effect. If he goes, she goes. If this happens, then I might not be promoted. If this happens, I'm going to cut myself here. If this happens, that mind gets to going. The devil will use all that try to stuff to sway you, to try to get you to think. He puts the fog in there so you can't think clearly about something that God has made very clear. God does not compromise with sin. I know modern churches have gotten to where they compromise with it. I know modern Christians have gotten to where they compromise with it. Preachers have gotten to where they compromise with it. Denominations have gotten to where they're compromising with it. Americans have compromised with it forever and a day because they're committing wicked sins or whatever. They're wanting to justify it because other people they know are doing things. So there's a compromise that's going down. God never compromises or condones sin. He says you need to separate from it, period. And we talk about our flesh, the tendency within us that says, you know what, a little bit won't hurt. You know what, those chains of Egypt, you know, just leave one chain on, just leave one shackle on, just keep some Egyptians around for old times. Just hang on to the photos, just hang on to the, the account, the social media, whatever connection you've got, just hang on to it, you may need it later. That's the devil using those connections to keep you in bondage. And the temptation is not to make that break, and that mind will get to thinking. 
You got to make a decision. The life of the Christian is decision after decision, and this thing of repentance is something that takes place in our life on a pretty daily basis. You deal with things in your life, there are certain things in your life you have to make a break from. Like I mentioned this morning, in your thoughts, you'll be going along, and here you are, you good, godly, great people here. You'll be going along tomorrow, and all these things start flooding through your head. You have to say, okay, I've I got to make a break right here. This stuff is not allowed. So what are you going to do? Well, maybe quote a verse of Scripture. That will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Uh, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Same as in the beginning with God. Whatever, just start changing your focus and make a break. Some of you have things you're holding on in the world that you're allowing in your life. God has told you, convicted you, you need to break from it. Kick him out. You got to make a decision. You're not going to go any further in your walk and your day-by-day -day basis until you make that break. Number two, distance. You've got to put some distance between you and Ishmael. Now, this thing is a pretty serious deal. You read about it here in chapter 21. And by the way, you can have Ishmael and be saved, but you can't have Ishmael and be sanctified. And there's a lot of saved people that are not sanctified. And by sanctification, I'm not dealing with the doctrinal part of it as far as salvation goes. I'm talking about living holy for Christ, living a clean life for Christ. You can be saved and go into heaven and not be set apart. And so you can, and also you can never get to Genesis 22 until you go through Genesis 21. You can never get to the place of true worship where you sacrifice Isaac until you kick out Ishmael. It's not going to happen. And by the way, Ishmael is not a sacrifice. Isaac is a sacrifice. Ishmael should just be kicked out anyway. You take him to the brow of the hill and you push him over. <laughs> and you watch him tumble, 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 tumble. Ah! I'm using a little humor. Lighten up a little bit. But you'll notice here in the text, this is a pretty big deal. He says you've got to put some distance here. Send him out. Get him away from here. Don't just set him on the back side of the property. You know, I'm going to go camping tonight, so he sits out in the backyard. No, you take your stuff, and I'll see you in eternity. Bye. I'm changing my phone number so you can't... You know, you don't have to answer those phone calls. You can change your numbers, you can shut the stuff off, and you can make a break. Half the drama in the world could be cut off just like that if people just make breaks. But no, they. I think here we have a dependency to feed off of that stuff. And we have this mentality to be persecuted. So we stay in the middle of some type of conflict that God said you need to go ahead and just make a break from it. Then you don't even have to worry about it. So notice the distance. Here's the excuses, but, it's, but he's family. Everyone else will see this as cruel. Whatever excuse it may be, you have to put distance. Then the next thing I want to say here is notice that uh, they put a, verse number 14, took, a, took bread, a bottle of water, and gave it to Hagar, put it on the shoulder, and send them off. I'll talk about diet. <laughs> you got to have distance, and let's talk about diet. You say, what do you mean? Quit feeding Ishmael. When you study the two natures in Romans chapter number 6, it talks about yielding either to the spirit or to the flesh. When you read in Galatians chapter number 5 about the flesh and the spirit, there's a contrast made between the two. And if you feed the spirit, like I told you, if you fall in love with Jesus Christ, you will fall out of love with the world. It's a natural thing. You can't have both at one time. It's like, you know, if you really start reading the Bible, you will... You don't want to read anything else. Not saying you shouldn't read anything else, but your time will be taken up with God. And so there's like, there's focus and there's attention put on Jesus. That means the focus and attention is off the other stuff.
And so if I'm feeding the new man, it's hard to feed the old man. What you have is Christians trying to keep both afloat. You have Christians trying to be lukewarm. In other words, they're trying to keep the old man, give him just enough food so he stays going all right. And then they want to have a little bit of church and they want to have a little bit of Bible and a little bit of Jesus because they don't want to feel so guilty and bad all the time. And they do want Jesus to, they want to feel that Jesus cares when they have a time of trouble. So they want to feed the new man a little bit, but they don't want to let go of the old man because he really likes to do this stuff over here and he enjoys it. So that struggle that we all have, by the way, you're not weird, you're schizophrenic because that's just the nature of being a Christian. You have a new nature and an old nature. So don't think you're weird. That's a good indication that you're saved. Amen. Paul says, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment sent came, sin revived and I died. There came a point to where he understood the knowledge of good and evil. He died, and that's as a kid learns that knowledge of good and evil. And now as a believer in Christ, he said, the things I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. If you are saved by God's grace, there are things that you do that make you upset that you do them because you know it doesn't please God. It bothers you that you give in to sin. And that ought to bother you. You ought to feel about sin how God feels about sin. You say, well, what's wrong? Why do I still do it? Because you have this old flesh. And I have this old flesh. The job is to starve the flesh out and to feed the new man. Don't give him any provisions. They gave him some bread and a bottle of water. It's not your job to keep Ishmael alive. He's standing there. Ishmael's got his sign, cardboard sign. He's standing there. Feed me. Standing out by Walmart. Anything helps. God bless. Veteran. <laughs> now they put all kind of things on there, you know, to get you. And you, you feel sorry for him. I've watched him do it. I've been behind him. And they pull out, you know, and they're giving him money. And I'm sitting there thinking, do you know what he's about to go do with that money? He has a habit or she has a habit and they're going to use that money. If you really want to give them some food, give them some food. I have done that before. You can ask my wife. I've done that where I have given them food if they wanted food. Most of the time they don't want to know, just give me the money and I'll go to the... No, you'll go and get alcohol with it. And I'm not going to support your habit. Ishmael says, feed me, feed me, feed me. You ain't got to feed him. It's not your responsibility to feed this wicked flesh. It's your responsibility to feed the new man, the spirit. I can't read the Bible for you. I can preach to you a little bit, but that's just a little bit on Sundays, a little bit on Wednesdays. You have to feed the new man. Don't provide for Ishmael. Ishmael gets so strong and healthy because even as believers, we just feed him. We, it's kind of like, you know, people breaking in people's houses. That's one thing. It's one thing when you come home, your door's been knocked in, the alarm system's going off, and somebody's in there. That's one thing. But when you leave the door wide open, don't be griping when somebody comes in and helps themselves. Christians leave the door wide open. Just let down your guard. And just feed the flesh. There are certain things that all of us know we need to stay away from. Now, I'm not going to start talking about Twinkies. <laughs> some of you, it may be a Twinkie. Some of you, it may be pasta. Some of you, it may be steak. <laughs> Fish. I mean, I don't know what it is. But when you compare it to that, you see the tendency. There are certain things you know I've got to stay away from. Don't feel sorry for them. The flesh says, well, you know, you've got to take care of me. I have my rights. I'm entitled. Don't you feel sorry for me? You're just going to send me out there to die? I was here before Isaac was. I've been here a whole lot longer than Isaac. This is mean. Surely... You must be misinterpreting the Bible. God wouldn't do this. God wouldn't be so cruel. Or maybe God is cruel. Maybe you got this thing all wrong. Maybe you got the wrong religion. 
You ever read Genesis 3, how the devil starts slow and he works his way in and he gets that thing all turned around for Eve to be thinking, yeah, God is holding something back from me. God just don't want me to be as smart. God just don't want me to know as much as my husband. What, my, maybe my husband didn't tell me everything. She, the devil's got her all flipped around. And he will flip you around if you're not careful. Quit feeding him. Then disregard Ignore his pain and obey God. He sends him out, and you'll notice some things here in the text. They go out, and of course, God takes care of Hagar. There's a whole other story, a whole other lesson with Hagar. She's running from her problems, obviously, later on, or previously, I should say. She ran, and God sent her back. But God's going to take care of her. But you'll notice in the text, God gives them some sustenance takes care of in verses 19, 20, and 21. But look down, if you will, the last part of verse 21. His mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. That's where he's from. It's in his blood, if you will. The propensity of Ishmael is to gravitate toward Egypt, the type of this world. And so Abraham has to learn this lesson. He has to realize, I've got to do, go, go ahead with this. I have to disregard any types of pleas. I have to make a hard decision to obey God. There are really no other options. It's kind of like a magnet. You take two magnets and you turn them and you try to push them to each other. You ever do that? You know, and they're bouncing them back and forth. You know, they, they, and you have to flip them around. They won't, it won't work that way. It's like oil and water. Isaac and Ishmael do not mix. Prophetically, and even in our own country, when we study the Middle East, you see that with the nation of Israel and Islam and so forth. But with us as believers, Isaac and Ishmael don't get along. The, the, the flesh does not appreciate spiritual things. Your flesh does not enjoy getting in the Bible, getting alone with God, Telling other people about Christ, maybe embarrassing yourself when you talk to people about Jesus. The flesh doesn't like that stuff. The flesh doesn't like giving away resources for spiritual things instead of keeping those resources for things that the flesh would like to do. You ever take up your totals from maybe the last five years of what you've contributed as far as tithes and offerings and see what you could buy? Don't do that. <laughs> I haven't done that either, but I'm telling you the flesh will say, man, look what all you could have done. You've been giving money for how many years? Let's look at those totals. Don't look at that stuff. Just give and let go of it. The flesh will, will try to grab and scratch and claw and fight on for existence until the Lord changes this flesh one day and we drop this flesh and rise to seize our everlasting prize. Disregard it. And finally, I'll say this. Sarah could see what needed to be done, and Abraham couldn't. Ishmael's got too many connections with Egypt. Sarah could read the handwriting on the wall. She had the discernment to see this. Although it's her fault, if you go back, she's the one to put Abraham up to this. Let's don't make her out to be, you know, Miss Queen here. She said, hey, let's do this situation with Hagar. So... She's not, you know, to be put off the hook. However, she saw this at this point. You know, sometimes others can see the Ishmael in your life and you can't see it. Sometimes it'll be a message. Sometimes it'll be a song. Sometimes it'll be a brother or sister in Christ. They'll just mention something to you and it hits you the wrong way. You get all puffed up with pride. You're like, what do you mean? What, well, I've got it under control. What, and you get all mad. It's all over. They can see it. You can't. God may be giving you a warning through someone like a Sarah or through a message or something to realize, you know, I better be careful. This Ishmael is turning into a monster. And when we deal with things like I was mentioning, I'm using that in humor. I'm not making fun of anyone that's on the street. When I see somebody on the street like that, I pray for them. And I thank God because if it wasn't for the grace of God, there go I. I believe that. You say, yeah, they're just using that money. Yeah, but that's still a bad situation to be in. That's still awful. And you look at the depraved situation of something like that.
God will point those things out to show us ourselves. And sometimes we can't even see it. You need to take the warning of Abraham seriously. Maybe you've been spending too much time feeding the flesh instead of the spirit. Instead of building up the new man in Christ, you've been tearing down the new man by building up the old man. Ishmael, man, he grows up and he becomes a warrior. What happens to Ishmael? Well, they become enemies of the nation of Israel. They become enemies of the descendants of Abraham and Sarah. And he grows and he gets more and more strength. And so the best thing to do is to make that decision, put that distance, and quit feeding the flesh. Here's the danger, though. You quit feeding him for a while and you think, oh, man, I got this, I got this thing whipped. Ishmael, man, he is, he, I, I pushed him off the cliff. I heard him hit the bottom, man. He ain't getting up. Yeah. Ishmael will surprise you. Yes, it's kind of like that story you heard about the uh, tiger uh, lion guy at the zoo. Or I think it was a tiger, guy who worked with tigers. He always go in there and he'd feed them their stuff. And he got to where he could get real close. And, and when he was not feeding times, he could get in there with them and he could stroke their hair. And they had this one particular tiger. They had some medical issues. So they had put him on this diet and basically weaned him off of food for several weeks. And they were feed, giving him water and treating his medical condition. He went in there just like normal, always able to stroke this tiger. I mean, this tiger is just about starved out. He didn't notice a scratch on his hand. And as soon as that starved out tiger smelled that fresh blood, you know exactly what happened. He revived. So, oh man, I got Ishmael in the corner. I got him, I got him all starved out. You better keep him starved out because you give him a little bit to chew on, he will rise up. You need to keep feeding the new man. Feed the new man every single day. Feed the new man. Starve out the old man. Feed the new man. Starve out the old man. If you don't, if you keep trying to play this, the battle that you are in now that is hard, it will be harder and harder and harder. And some Christians get to the point, and we talk about Christians getting out of the race and Christians that have quit fighting. Oftentimes we're talking about the spiritual battle between not just the world system, which that's caving in on top of us all the time, not just the spiritual influence of the devil, which is behind the principalities and powers and all of that, which is bad enough, but mainly we're dealing with the personal battle of you and your flesh. And some Christians finally say, I'm tired of this. They've fed, the, they've given too much ammunition to the flesh. Jesus mentions it, Paul actually mentions it as well. So if you want to be dispensationally correct, we'll go to Paul's epistles. Paul, on occasion, fasted. He spent time with God. He realized this flesh is too powerful. And so we have to come to a place in our life that we're willing to say no to the flesh because you keep feeding it and you keep feeding it and you keep allowing this in your life and you allow this in your life and you allow this in your life. Well, it's the kids. Well, it's the grandkids. And aren't they so cute? And it's this and it's that. And sometimes people quit by default. They get out of the fight simply by default because they are so carnal and so fleshly, spiritual things have no appeal whatsoever. You mean we're going to sit there and we're not even going to get a screen to look at? Preacher, you're not even going to put a bouncy thing on a screen so I can follow? I can't sit there for 30 or 45 minutes and listen to somebody talk. I've got to have something for my flesh to watch. Who likes old documentaries where they don't have music and a guy just sits there and says, and so we know, back in World War I days, we blah, 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 blah. No, man, I need to see action. I need the picture to change every five seconds. I need blood and guts, and I need music, and I need machine guns, and I need... That's the modern Christian. So sometimes it's by default. The modern Christians are so full of the flesh, spiritual things are not even attractive to them at all. It's a bad place to be at. The best thing to do is to make a decision, make a break, put some distance between you and the flesh, disregard his cries. He'll say, feed me, feed me. Don't forget about me. It's been a long day today. We've been in church all day. 
Preacher's preaching. We got all these problems out there in the world. I need some flesh. I need some food. Please take care of me tonight. Hurry up and get me to Monday. The thing cries out. So what do you do? Just give it a Bible verse and tell it to shut up. It's a battle. It's a battlefield. Let's roll off you to say it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight, not a game. We've got to fight the good fight of faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the great example of Abraham. God, I pray that we might all implement some of these things in our own personal struggles. God, we know that as we get closer to you, we know the flesh puts on the, uh, the show. We know the flesh rises up and combats the spirit. And Lord, if it's not something that's overtly wicked, it'll just be murmuring and griping and complaining. It'll just be selfishness and, and covetousness, or it may be pride, or it may be criticism of other people. All these spiritual things as well, they enter in into the mind. And God, I pray that you may help us to see these things, recognize them, and also, Lord, to take counsel from the Word of God and from messages we hear and from other people in our lives, the Sarahs in our lives that say, hey, you need to watch out for this. The Sarahs in our lives and the things that you bring up in our lives to help us to realize we need to quit feeding Ishmael and we need to kick him out. God, I pray that you give us the courage to make some personal decisions in our own life. Lord, help us to have balance as we face things in our own society, especially at this time that we find ourselves in. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to plan and prepare, but also to be in prayer and to realize that we have to have peace with you as we go through these things, not to be consumed with the cares of this life, to keep our focus on Jesus Christ throughout this. Lord, help us to be a good testimony and a good example to those around us. And we pray, God, that you may just encourage us with the Word of God and help us in our daily lives. Thank you for being with us today. Pray for our church family that you may watch over them. And we just look for you. Lord, we pray you might even come back quickly, even before we get started with this week. Even so, come Lord Jesus is our prayer. We ask it in His name. Amen.